Welcome to video two for week nine. In this video, we're going to start extending the notion of derivatives to scalar fields. When we extended the derivative to parametric curves, the derivative was a new thing. Instead of the slope of a tangent line, it became a tangent vector. But there was one clear extension. The derivative is the tangent vector. And then from that, we took higher derivatives to get curvature and torsion and those other notions that we use to describe the motion of parametric curves. For scalar fields, the situation is not quite as clean. We don't have one single extension of the derivative. We're going to have a bunch of things that all extend the derivative in their own kinds of way, each of them extending a piece of the concept of the single variable derivative. The first of those is the partial derivative. So let's define what we mean here. So we have some scalar field. The partial derivative is what happens is if we take one of the variables, and we call it x for now, we differentiate in that variable, pretending that everything else is a constant. That means we can do ordinary single variable derivatives. There's no new derivative rules. It's all exactly the same as it was before. We just pretend the other variables are constant. The single variable derivative notation, at least using Leibniz notation, is this df over dx. The partial derivative notation comes from this, but to make it clear that this is not a simple derivative, but instead a partial derivative, we use this sort of stylized d, which I'm going to call del. And I'm going to read this as del f del x, which is the partial derivative in x. Likewise, this is the partial derivative in y. This is the partial derivative in z. And this is the partial derivative in some variable xi. And in each of these cases, whatever the variable that is indicated in Leibniz notation, we pretend that's the only variable. We pretend everything else, all the other variables, we just pretend they're constants. You can see how Leibniz notation is quite nice here because we need to specify is the, which variable we're dealing with. Newton's notation of f prime doesn't tell you what the variable is, so we really need to rely on something like Leibniz notation. However, there are still quite a few different derivative notations. So the partial derivative can be written in this full notation using this Leibniz style fraction as del f del x. It can be written as f subscript x. Sometimes we just have this del subscript x or even d subscript f. These are all different ways of writing the partial derivative. I'm going to use these first two quite frequently, not as much these the second and third or the third and fourth here. But do be aware, particularly of this part of this subscript, writing f subscript x for the partial derivative in x is really quite a convenient and succinct notation. If I wanted to be formal about this, let me look in R2 for a moment. So the partial derivative is actually still given by a limit definition. And this limit definition looks exactly like the single variable limit definition. I just have this plus h in the x variable, and the y variable hasn't changed at all. As far as this limit is concerned, the y variable is constant. There's only an adjustment to the x variable with this x plus h. And likewise, the partial derivative in y has this plus h on the y variable and is essentially treating the x variable as constant. So I have these slight adjustments, but more or less exactly the same limit definition of the derivative as I had in single variable calculus. So formally, it really is the same derivative. And since it's the same limit derivative, and the limit derivative is used to prove all of the differentiation rules, all of the rules we already have work. And let's go to some examples to see how that works. So here's a two variable function, a scalar field in R2. Let me take its partial derivative in x and its partial derivative in y. So first, it's partial derivative in x. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Derivative of this in x, y squared is a constant as far as the x derivative is concerned. So it just stays there. I can pull it out by linearity. And then I can just differentiate sine to get cosine. However, if I differentiate this in y, this is a constant as far as y is concerned. So its derivative is just 0. It goes away. This as far as y concerned, is multiplication by some constant and then y squared. So the y squared becomes 2y, and then the constant is just still there. We can pull constants out of derivatives. So as far as the y derivative is concerned, I destroy this piece because there are no y's there at all. This piece becomes 2y, and I still multiply by the sign. That gives me the two partial derivatives of this function. Here's another example. This first piece is a little bit trickier, so let me talk a little bit about del del x. 1 over x, y. So here the 1 over y is a constant, so I can pull that out and then differentiate in x. Really anything that doesn't involve the variable I'm differentiating in can be pulled out by linearity. 
And then the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. So that's going to give me negative 1 over y, x squared, or x squared, y, however you want to write it, which is exactly what I have here. Um, note I'm using this as an operator the same way I used derivative operators in single variable calculus. So this partial derivative notation can also be used as an operator. Derivative here, this is a chain rule derivative. So the derivative of e to the u is still e to the u. The derivative of the inside, del del x of xy, well, the y comes out, derivative of x is 1. So I just get the y here. So I end up with the y out front as the constant multiplied by the variable in this chain rule calculation. I could do the partial derivative in y as well. It looks very, very similar, but the variables are switched. And that makes sense because this is actually symmetric in x and y. So here I have instead of x squared, I have y squared. Instead of y, I have x. And the rules are exactly the same. The same reasoning gives me that partial derivative in y. And I can use all the rules that I have. So here's a quotient. I need to use quotient rule. So I want to differentiate an x. Well, I differentiate the numerator. 2x squared becomes 2x. The y squared is a constant. Derivative of x is 1. The y is a constant. So derivative of the numerator times the denominator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of the denominator in the variable x. This is constant. This is constant. They go away. I just get 2x. And then I divide by the denominator squared using the quotient rule. Same thing for the derivative of f in y. Uh, I differentiate the numerator. y squared becomes 2y. The x is constant, sticks around. Derivative of this and y is just the, the constant x as far as y is concerned. Derivative of the numerator multiplied by the denominator minus the numerator multiplied the derivative of the denominator. Again, in the variable y, this is a constant, this is a constant, they go away. The only thing we care about is this 2y, this y squared, its derivative is 2y. We divide by the denominator squared. The notion of differentiability can be defined via these partial derivatives. A function is said to be differentiable at a point if all of its partial derivatives exist at a point. And this is going to be a major theme going forward, is we're now going to build ideas about the derivative by putting the partials together into some kind of whole. And there's going to be a bunch of different ways we do that. Differentiability comes from just going through all those partials and checking each one. We can also take higher partial derivatives. And this is exactly the same as we had for the notation for higher derivatives and lambdas before. This is taking the derivative of x twice in both steps, pretending everything else is constant taking the derivative in y twice, taking the derivative in z twice, taking the derivative in xi twice. Those look very much like higher derivatives we had for single variable functions, just pretending everything else is constant. What's really new is the notion of a mixed partial derivative. So this is a second derivative. One of the derivatives is in the variable y, one of the derivatives is in the variable x. With these, like with composition, we work from right to left. So what we have is we're going to take the derivative in y first, and then we're going to take the derivative in x. And the reason for that is we think of this as an operator operating on the function f. So the thing that is closest gets to act first, and the thing that is furthest away gets to act afterwards. When we take the y derivative, we pretend x is constant. And then when we take the x derivative, we switch. When we take that derivative, we pretend y is constant. So in these partials, we're allowed, in these mixed partials, we're allowed to flip back and forth between what we're pretending is a variable and what we're pretending is a constant. And these can be as complicated as you want. Here's a fourth derivative. First you differentiate in y, then in z, then in y again, and finally in x. So you can have as complicated a mixed partial as you want. This gets put together into a whole notion of differentiability. I said a function is differentiable if all of its partials exist. Well, its higher orders of differentiability also depend on its partials. So again, if I have a scalar field defined on some domain, if I said, say f is in the class Cn, that means that all of its partials of degree n are defined, including the mixed ones. So if it's C2, that means it's pure partials. f derivative, a second derivative of an x are defined, as well as its mixed partials, dy, dx. 
If I wanted to specify this domain, I can talk about the class CN bracket A, that specifies that things that are defined on this particular domain. And if all the derivatives exist, I'll say it has class C infinity. This is a really nice shorthand to refer to the existence of all these partial derivatives. Again, remember that if, it, if it's in class C3, then all of the possible partial derivatives of degree three, all of the possible mixtures have to exist. Let me do some partial derivative, higher partial derivative examples here before we finish off this video. So here's a polynomial in two variables. So this is a scalar field in R2. Let's take its first, it's partial in x. So uh, I differentiate this, that's gonna give me nine x squared, the y is a constant. I differentiate this, derivative of x is one, there's a constant. Der differentiate this, x squared becomes two x, this is a constant, and this constant goes away. Likewise, if I differentiate in y, here, derivative of y squared is two y, so multiply by two by three to get six x cubed y, the x is a constant as far as the y derivative goes. Uh, here, the derivative of y to the four is four y cubed, the x is a constant, it sticks around. Derivative of y squared is two y, x is a constant, sticks around, derivative of three is zero. And then I can keep going. From here to here, I take another derivative in x. So I've taken one derivative, I want the second derivative in x. Uh, derivative of x squared is two x, so I'm gonna get 18 x, the y squared is constant, just stays there. This goes away because now I'm taking a derivative again in x, there's no x's here. Y is a constant in the partial derivative of x, so that disappears. And here, two y squared is a constant, derivative of x is one, so all I've left is the two y squared. From here to here, I'm differentiating a second time in y. Uh, here, get some space. Derivative of y is one, these are constants, so I get this six x cubed. Here, derivative of y cubed is three y squared, three times four is 12. The x is a constant, just sticks around. Here, derivative of y is one, so all I've left over is the two x squared. And then I can keep going. Uh, derivative of this, the third derivative of an x, I'll differentiate an x again. So the derivative of x is one, 18 y squared is a constant, it sticks around, no y is here, so that just goes to zero. So all I've left for the third derivative of an x is 18 y squared. If I want to differentiate here in y again, this will go away, this will go away, and I'll get negative 24 x y, which is exactly what I have here. Then if I want to differentiate in x yet again, I'll look at this expression. There are no x's left, so if I differentiate in x a fourth time, I finally get zero. If I differentiate this in y again to get the fourth derivative in y, derivative of y is one, negative 24 x is constant. Then if I differentiate one more time, well, derivative of zero is zero, and here there are no more y's, so that derivative is also zero. And that makes sense, because this is a polynomial where the degree in either variable is no higher than four, so the fifth derivative should in fact be zero. Let me do one more higher partial derivative example to make a point which I'll then end this video on. I'm not gonna be too particular about all of the details of these derivatives, feel free to check them if you wish, wish. but if we pretend that y is a constant differentiating x, we get this expression. If we pretend that x is constant differentiating y, we get this expression. And then we look, let me look at these mixed partials. So if I take this, derivative in x and then differentiate in y. So this is going to give me y squared goes to two y's, so that's going to give me 18 x squared y, derivative of this in y is four y cubed, derivative of this in y is four x y. That's going to give me the partial first in x, which is this, and then in y. So to get from here to here, I pretended that x, y was constant. To get to from here to here, I pretended that x was constant. I can do it the other way around. I can do y first and then x. So that means I need to take this and take an x derivative now. If I do that, I get this expression. And you might notice these are exactly the same. That the partial in x and then in y is the same as the partial in y and then in x. This is not a coincidence. So if I have a scalar field defined on some domain in Rn and x and y are two of the variables, as long as all of the second partials exist, then I can actually interchange the order that the mixed partials, I can do x and then y, and I do y and then x, as I did down here, and get exactly the same thing. This is true because this thing is a polynomial, so all of its derivatives, 
derivatives exist. In particular, all of its second derivatives exist. This theorem says the second derivatives need to exist, and under that condition, the order of the derivatives can be changed. This is called Clairaut's theorem. And this is quite a useful theorem, because sometimes one of the derivatives is much, much easier to do. So if we're allowed to interchange the order, we can choose which order we do the mixed derivatives, doing y and then x, or doing x and then y.